With Nani's story finished, the others ran into the house, all excitedly telling Mirai how they all entered the house at different times, but they all saw each other at the same time. They were excitedly talking about and even theorizing about how time was twisted around like that. And while they theorized about it, I placed my hand on the bottle around my neck, and for a moment I could see the imp, even if no one else could see her. She said that the way she looks to me isn't the way she appears to herself, but that she always appeared in different ways to everyone who owned her bottle. To me, she appeared like the older sister I always wanted. She would have fit in with the local punk pride club at Agamemnon's upperclassmen without a second glance. Her hair was shorter than her ears, strands of it sticking out and some of it sticking up like it was gelled. Her black tunic had spikes along her shoulders, and her leggings were red and black stri horizontal stripes. Can you, what can you tell me about the creatures, Jenu, the snow maiden, or whatever Nani is? I asked her in my head while my friends continued to talk among each other, not realizing I was standing there silently, speaking to the imp through my mind. I wish I could have her name, but it was the only thing she couldn't give me. When I asked for her name spoken, it would only sound like static, and if written, she would only write in scribbles. So, I would only know my imp friend as imp. If I knew her name, I could free her. Giving her a name that wasn't her was an evil I wasn't going to commit even if all I could do was to dress her by a title rather than a name. She told me it didn't bother her, but it was a lie. I knew lies, and I knew liars. Well, the Genu are a legend among the Mi'kmaq, a nation in the northern forest in Vinland. Cannibalistic giants, not quite so, so not quite a reconstructed undead made from animal parts and butcher twine. That interpretation is closer to the work of Mr. Frankenstein. Not Dr. Frankenstein? I asked as she shook her head and removed a pair of glasses out of her pocket. As she put them on and she pretended to be Miss Shrieker for a moment, her history and literature teacher. Well, actually, Victor Frankenstein was never a doctor, not even a scientist. A cut-rate alchemist who dropped out of college to marry his sister because he couldn't even bother to be a good parent to Adam Ben Victor. But yes, similar to the popular viewing of how Victor created the first Promethean, disjointed body parts brought together to create a new being. That being said, if a Promethean ate human flesh, it would not be unlikely for a northern Forestian, call them a genu. Similar to how a Frank might call a sufferer an unclean spirit, or how an Imperial may call a cannibal complex a Wendigo complex. So, prepare for something flesh-hungry in the basement. The Snow Maiden, on the other hand, I have a bit more information on. There are variations in Gothic, Taurican, Scythian, and Archimedean folklore, Imp said. Quite a lot of variation, I said back. Still, no one noticed the conversation that I was having and what was taking me a few minutes. But to them, there was only a few seconds of silence on my end. Indeed, but the same basic idea as this. The child is made from snow. The child is incredibly vulnerable to heat. In most stories, she dies by jumping over a fire, usually with friends who convince her to jump over the fire with her. While we aren't likely to jump over a fire with her, she is vulnerable to heat. But there is another fact that moves her from a mere curiosity to legitimate threat. Her grandfather is dead Moraz, or Grandfather Frost. You probably know him better as the Winter Man, Im said in the silence. Yeah, I know him. What do you have on Nani? I asked only for him to shake her head. Nothing. There is nothing in the Explorer's Encyclopedia that has any real information on her. There are Nippon legends about no pair of bow, faceless ghosts, which mostly just scare people with a lack of face. Except they're not supposed to have faces and reflections. 
There are a few inklings about a Slender Man, but Nani is definitely not a Slender Man. Whatever Nani is, I have no information on her at all. You're on your own there, Imp said before she vanished into smoke and the smell of cordite as my friends finally approached me. My perception on time, finally, back to normal. What did you learn about this house? Mirai asked me as I began to explain the story. And when that was done, I explained my own thoughts to them. So, I think based on the order of the story, we are going to deal with Barnabas, then Vera, and finally Nani. We know to expect a flesh-eating monster in the basement, who likely hates all human life, a frozen elemental who is the granddaughter of the most powerful dark sorcerer on the planet, and finally an unknown creature that is either a ghost or similar entity. I told them, Demon? Mary asked, a brief tremble in her voice. I shook my head. This definitely wasn't demonic. The only demonic thing I felt all night was imp. She isn't divine either. She didn't... I moved my hands around my head trying to explain what I saw in her. She didn't feel right. She wasn't like hell. She wasn't like Medusa. She wasn't like them, I explained. Whatever she is, she is more like... It's hard to put into words that what she was. There were no words on the walls. Her sins weren't on her head. That is more terrifying than a demon in my experience. Except for imp, demons have their sin on their foreheads. It's easy to understand what drives a person when you see their sin. It's their shame, guilt, their drive, their desires. They weren't sins in a traditional or religious way but a person's crime or guilt. I could even see it in reflections, including my own. I saw no sins on Nani's head. So whatever she was was either someone with no sin, something that could not sin, or someone who felt no guilt for sinning. None of those options were good, but I only knew a few beings without sin, and she was absolutely no angels. Angels wouldn't reveal their face to anyone, let alone someone like me. She was like the monster that lives in the basement, the shadow under the bed, or even one of the twins of blasphemy. Something low on the chamber scale, but she is absolutely something on that scale. I explain only for Mirai to scoff. <laughs> the chamber scale is like measuring earthquakes by how many people died from it. I cannot even trust you to use an accurate scale on this monster. How can we trust you to tell us how to beat this thing? They asked me, only for me to shake my head back. It's what we have. I didn't have time to measure her Hume readings. We should move on to the next part of the house if we want to get our wishes. I said to the group, only for Valera to ask. Well, where are we supposed to go? He asked, only for a loud knock on the wall to cause us to look and see a door opening into dim light with stairs leading into the basement. That is definitely the way down. The narrative is quite strong there. I pointed out only for Valera to ask. How do we know there isn't any other way out of here? He asked and I gestured around the room. What door do you see that leads out of here? I asked him. And he finally realized there was no way out of here, except for the door we came in from the door leading down into the basement. There was a fire and a chair, but otherwise the room was very bare, even though it feels like it should be a more full or traditional room. Well, I don't want to go down there, Valero said, almost like a child, as he crossed his arms and I shrugged before I began to make my way down the stairs. Grabbing the creaking banister as I made my way down, Mirai and Mary following close behind, only for Valera to follow a few steps behind. Not because he felt brave with us, but because he was more scared of being alone as the door slammed shut behind us, we walked down the barely lit basement stairs. Step by step, we went down, and by the thirteenth step, we made it to the next landing, and I could see more stairs leading down to the darkness and another landing. A few bare bulbs lit the way as we made it further down, 
step by step, and on the 13th step, we made it to another landing. More darkness below, more steps down, and the lights only grew dimmer as we went further down. Step by step, and after 13 steps, we made it to the stone floor. Above us were a few dim bulbs that barely made it visible inside of the basement. On the far wall were shelves full of ancient looking jars, full of strange body parts and curios that likely would have been seen in old freak shows of the previous centuries. I saw a jar labeled Tongue of a Liar, the tongue still moving, squirming and squishing and squeezing like a mixture of snail and snake. Moving a lot like a father's promise. Then I saw a brown jar labeled angel feathers. The feathers inside of the jar scurrying and flitting around each other, reminding me of white and gray beetles that flew and scrambled over each other, all trying to climb over one another, without actually being able to get out, nor stop any others from trying to get out. The feathers were definitely something very unique, but those weren't the only jars on the shelves. Then the other jars were full of things like spiders, still crawling across each other and staring at me from inside the jar as they crawled across each other. Even though I wasn't arachnophobic, even the idea of touching the jar or going anywhere near those spiders unsettled me deeply. When I came near the jar, or the jar of eyes, all of them with golden pupils and deep red scleras, all of the eyes following us around the room, and the label called them the eyes of the golden one. Then there was a jar that was simply labeled nothing. What was inside of the jar was some dark substance that looked darker than the darkness around it. And despite its simple or even non-existent substance in that jar, my instincts were telling me that whatever was in that jar was on the chamber scale, and the idea of something being powerful, neither good nor evil, was something to be afraid of. Then we heard a struggling breath from across the basement, and we turned that way to the only place in the entire basement that had a strong light bulb. The light above shook slightly, along with the desperate gasps of the creature that was below the light. Barnabas Woodcarver, the Genu of the Pumpkin House. His hair had grown patchy, some of it down to his chest, and other hair barely more than a few centimeters long. His forehead was peeling back, with his bare skull revealed beneath. A few cracks in the bone revealed gray matter behind the skull that squeezed through the cracks in his skull. Both of his eye sockets were scraped empty. The last few bits of eye matter dripped down his cheeks, which were coated in blood that congealed to his face and stuck with a few strands of hair that seemed to heal into his skin. His mouth was once nailed shut, like in the story. The flesh around his lower jaw rotted off, so now the nail stood in the middle of his mouth, iron scraping against his bone as he opened and closed his exposed lower jaw with every breath. His upper jaw is still whole, for the most part, with numerous teeth, and below his head was his destroyed arms and legs. Both his arms and legs were broken and healed crooked many times over. His hands and feet both nailed into the stone ground, not allowing him any movement, and he was coated in blood. But the greatest horror was the Genu's chest. His ribs were broken and pulled back like the petals of a flower pulled back. Most of his organs were removed, kept in the jars on the shelf behind us. Iron clamps with a keyhole clamped his chest open, holding his skin and muscle back, and it was clear he was cut open like an autopsy. 
and inside of his chest, the only organ remaining, was his frozen heart. The heart struggled to pump. Every movement was made to the cracking of the blue ice that coated the organ that kept the monster in front of us alive. The creature was the son of the woodcarver family. Behind him on the stone wall, written in blood, I could see his sins written. Patricide. Cannibal. Father of monsters. The blood set on the wall. Mira gulped and they whispered to me. It must be pretty bad to have crimes written on the wall like that. Mira said, and instead I spoke out loud. It isn't the crimes that are written that are the worst. It's the crimes that never had a chance to be written that are the worst. I said as I approached the mounted figure to get a closer look at him. The forehead was bare of skin and the cracks which revealed gray brain matter beneath, but there was no sin on his forehead. And I glanced down at his hands. He could see old blood on his hands, long since dried and brown, not the hands of the killer, with blood still flowing from his hands, the hands of someone who was in pain. I wouldn't get closer if I was you, the familiar voice said. And I turned to where I heard the voice. Down a hallway I did not see before was Nani, the faceless woman. She stood in the hallway, standing aside as her voice reverberated, and despite there not being a mouth for her to speak through. You can just walk away through the hall. Leave him to his sins. Don't let him go, she said, and I turned to face her. Still, no sins on her forehead. And what if I let him go? A bad idea. He is a monster, and if you release him, there is nothing keeping him from hurting you. I want to let him go. Why would you do that? Mira asked me, and I ignored them. Well, Nani answered again. Why would you ever release a guilty man from his just punishment? Nani asked me, and I responded. I wouldn't. I am releasing an innocent man from punishment, I said, and Nani shrugged her shoulders before she stepped back into the darkness, disappearing from view, her voice echoing through the basement. The key is kept in the jar of nothing, she said, and I turned it back to the jars. Of course it was in the jar of nothing, the most disturbing jar in the entire basement. A jar without anything in it? That'll be easy getting a key out of, Valero said, while Mirai blanched and Mary shook her head, and she explained it to him. The jar isn't empty. The jar has nothing in there. Isn't that the same thing? He asked before I spoke up to explain. Nothing isn't the same as emptiness. We are in Adonsi's realm, so words mean things. Don't words always mean things? Valero asked, and I closed my eyes, and I quietly explained to myself. He has a 67% in literacy, 71% in humanities, 12% in diplomacy, and negative 13% in pataphysics. You have to break it down simpler. I said to myself before I smiled as I had the best way for him to understand. Just reach into the jar then. Pull out the key. I said as I carefully picked up the jar of nothing. My skin crawled when I touched the jar. It was cold, but it had no condensation on the jar. When I handed it to Valero, he confidently chuckled as he easily unscrewed the jar lid. There, he tipped the jar upside down, and when he did, nothing came out of the jar. So he peered into the jar. It's too dark. I can't see anything. Maybe it's taped in there? He asked as he reached into the jar with his hand. And when he did, his confident grin disappeared when he put his hand into the jar. When he didn't find anything, he reached further into the jar. Up to his wrist was gone into the jar, more of his arm in the jar than the exterior dimensions could possibly hold. What the hell is this? Is it like an illusion or some kind of trick? Why is there so much space? 
he asked as he reached up to his elbow into the jar. And I finally explained. Some people just don't listen to the harbinger. Sometimes they have to see the danger before they listen. There's nothing in the jar. Not nothing like the absence of something. Nothing as in the metaphysical concept of void and absence. You could store Altus within a drop of nothing. And what you have there is an entire jar of nothing. You could search your entire life and not find anything in nothing. And that's why it's my challenge. I have to find a key in nothing to let Barnabas out. I said as he pulled his arm out and he handed me the jar. I stared into the darkness of the jar as I closed my eyes and I reached inside, careful not to gaze into the abyss. I have gazed into too many already, and I know the abyss doesn't just gaze back. Sometimes the abyss reaches out and grabs you. The interior of the jar was cold, but not cold the way a freezer is cold. Cold like how loneliness was cold. Cold like how hunger was cold. Cold like how sadness was cold. And it was into this cold that my hand plunged. Unlike Valero, though, I could feel the things in the nothing, which is hard to describe, but it's like being in a dark room and feeling the difference between playing cards, tarot cards, and business cards. I could feel something sharp prickle my skin. Hungry for blood, but not quite piercing my skin. I could feel something slither in the jar. Something scaly, slimy, and sinister. Still, I kept reaching into the jar, keeping my eyes closed, focusing on what I could feel in the jar. Trying to ignore the cold nothing. As sinister as the slithering was, it was something real. Nothing was something that was unreal, deadly as anything real. Finally, I touched something that felt iron, cold metal instead of cold and nothing. It practically felt burning in my hand with how great the difference in temperature was. As I pulled the key out of nothing, and I held the key out in front of everyone. Was that on your wrist? Mirai asked me as I realized my sweater sleeve slid up some, revealing one of the brands on my wrist. I quickly slid the sweater up my wrist so it was now covered. I think it marked my skin. Should fade soon, but we can let Barnabas free now, I said as I approached the tied up Genu. Why well, let him go? It doesn't benefit us, Valero asked as I thought I would explain it to him, but then I decided I would answer but not for his benefit. The enemy of my enemy is not always my friend, but when the enemy of my enemy is freed from prison, my enemy now has two enemies. I answered falsely. The truth was I only wanted to release Barnabas because I couldn't bear to see an innocent imprisoned for a crime they didn't do. Hell was full of men who would drag the innocent with them if they could. They didn't care if it made their suffering worse, as long as they hurt someone else on the way there. I was well aware of what it was like to be innocent and damned. I reached into the Genu's open chest with the key, where cold waves came off the frozen heart. As I opened the lock and it fell out of his body, I quickly withdrew my hand from the cavity as the chest slowly began to heal. That done, I leaned close to whisper into his ear, When you are healed, you can leave your prison, whether that is tonight, tomorrow, or another day. Leave when you are able to. Know that when you leave, nothing will bring you back here. Nothing more than your own will. I told him as I stood up, and I pointed towards the dark hallway, as we made our way there. Still, for a moment, I was certain that the Genu followed my progress with his head. The hallway was dark, a few flickering gas lamps every few meters that were dimmer than I expected. 
and the hull grew colder as we traveled down it. The walls, floor, and ceiling slowly transitioned into wood, somehow, and we passed by door after door, each one locked, and the hull continued to grow colder as we found a door with frost on the knob and on the paneling, seemingly the source of the cold in the hallway, a door that had wordless singing behind it. I think this is Vera's room, I said as I noticed that unlike the other doors, there was a lock we could open. So I knocked on the door. Inside, the singing stopped, and I called into the room. Hello, Vera. My name is Mercy. My friends and I are passing by. I can let you out of your room if you want, I offered, but I wasn't sure what I was expecting. But what happened was not it. You're lying. They always lie. I am never let out. I am never free. They tell me that, and when I try to open the door, it, it's locked. It's always locked. There is no reason to try. It hurts to be lied to. But as long as I don't believe, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to be lied to if you don't believe it, Vera said. She believed I was lying. It didn't matter if she believed me or not. She wouldn't even try to leave if she thought it was a lie. It didn't matter if I was or wasn't lying. As long as she thought I was lying, she would remain stuck in the room. But I remember something my father said. You cannot force someone through a door, but you can show them the door is open and walk through it yourself, and then they will follow. So I flipped the lock, and then I pushed the door open, and I could see the inside of her room. When I heard the story, I imagined a room full of books and art hanging on the walls. A quiet place where someone made the best they could out of their situation. Instead, what I got was like something out of an old asylum. She had a bare mattress on the floor. Her paintings were covered in frost in the corner. Her books ripped apart and the torn pages stuck to the walls in more frost. With no control over her life, all she could do was destroy her space. She might have tried to create in it once, or try to be artistic in it. Except that isn't enough when you are trapped in the same space. You feel helpless. You feel powerless. You feel more confined as you try to paint more. You feel more isolated when you read adventures followed by others. You feel suffocated when you dream of open space. So you destroy what you can, create a little chaos, just so that you know you have control over just this one part of your life. And then there was Vera herself. She was naked, her skin pale as snow, and so was her hair. The self-inflicted scars along her body, carved in by her own nails. They were divots in her icy skin. Each breath she took was icy. And when she looked my way, I could see colorless eyes staring back at me. If she didn't look me in my eyes, I would have thought that she was blind. This is a trick. It's a lie. It's a lie. You're waiting for me to stand or walk over to close the door in my face. No one would release me. No one would release me. I am the perfect snow globe. You better not open the snow globe. If you do, the snow inside melts. It doesn't matter. My job is to be perfect. Perfect. My parents will come for me. They will. I need to be here like a good snow doll, Vera said, her eyes glancing around the room like she was waiting for a stick to come out and hit her. Vera, your parents died a long time ago from the sound of it. There is no one else coming for you. You don't need to stay in here. You never should have been locked in here, and for that, I am sorry. You can leave if you want to. You have a choice now that should have never been taken from you, I said as I stepped further inside, offering her my hand. It's a trick, a trick. If I go with you, you'll just shut the door in my face again, Vera said, her eyes flicking around the room again. Vera, 
If the door closes in your face, then I'll be stuck in here with you as well. At least then you won't be alone. Is that worth the risk? I asked her, my hand out to her. As she looked up at me, and she grabbed my hand, the cold once again radiating through my body, but I could see steam rising from her hand as she stood. Her touch was soft, and even though she looked older than me, she was shorter than I was. Years of melting bit by bit wore away at her, and even now she was melting some by touching me, but her grip tightened around my fingers like she was afraid I would melt away. Now standing together, we turned to the door and we stepped towards freedom. Each step was frigid, but it got easier. As every step she took, she trusted me more, and I could see my friends' faces. Mary was crestfallen and near tears. Mirai was unreadable, but Valero, he was smiling his hand on the door. Don't you fucking dare, I told him, but he did dare. He swung the door closed, mere centimeters from both Vera and I escaping the room. It didn't matter it was no benefit to him. It didn't matter that it would hurt Vera. It didn't matter that it would hurt me. All he knew was it would be funny to further torment someone who was already tormented so he would torment her for a fucking laugh. He'd have his laugh and he'd walk away. Vera would carry another scar on her icy heart. I would carry another brand that I couldn't show anyone, and he would forget his cruelty because it was just another laugh to him. Though, before the door had a chance to slam shut, a hand stopped the door, a hand I could not see the owner of, but the door was not shut. When I reached the door, I pushed it all the way open, and I could see the owner of the hand, Mary. Crestfallen and in tears, she kept the door open so that Vera could leave with me. Valero was too busy laughing to notice his cruel prank wasn't finished. And Mirai, they were staring daggers at Mary, like they wanted the door to slam shut, keeping Vera and me trapped inside. Don't do that to your allies, they said to Valero. They pushed him back against the wall while he kept laughing. It was just so perfect. If they don't want me to do that, why did they let me do that? He asked as Vera took her first steps outside her room, and she glanced down both ways down the hallway. Is it okay that I stay here? I don't think I'm ready to go far. Vera asked as I nodded and I let her go. You're free now. That includes being free to leave or free to stay. Your life is your own. You can take any risk you want or you can keep it as safe as you want. Just that know that your life is your time. It's what you want to spend it on. I told her as we continued down the hall. Valera was still smiling, and Mirai was whispering to him as we continued. Mary walked next to me. Why did you keep the door from closing? I asked her. Someone once kept a door open for me. Who would I be if I kept doors closed? She asked. Someone who would make both of our parents proud. That's an excellent point, Mercy, but there is something you haven't considered. What is that? Fuck both of our parents, she said as we made our way to the room just before the center of the pumpkin house, place where my imp was very antsy to be at, but I couldn't see why. She was not oddly quiet. There was no power keeping her confined. I think she didn't want to be seen by me, but if that was so, why was she so anxious? The final room was full of mirrors like a mirror maze, where you couldn't tell what was a reflection and you couldn't see yet, and what was an empty space. But then from the shadows walked Nani. In every reflection, I could see her face, but in none of them could I see the blank face, so clearly she was hiding her true body somewhere else. Welcome to the final challenge, 
I see you've let my siblings go, but still, I am here. Do you think you can get past me? Nani asked, each reflection with her voice calling through, so I couldn't identify where she was by sound. This is way too easy. We just need to start breaking mirrors and then we can find the way through, Valero said as he stepped forward and punched the first mirror he saw. The glass cracked and immediately his knuckles were bloody and cuts were along the back of his hand. Motherfucker, that hurt, he said as the glass repaired itself and within seconds it was whole again. Nani standing there without issue, with Valero's reflection not visible in the mirror. This isn't like the movies, Valero. Glass hurts when you break it, and that isn't going to work with how quickly these mirrors reform. Mark them, break them, or even breathe on them, and they repair and clean themselves. But you will keep hurting yourself if you keep trying. Nani said as Valero decided to punch where her face was in the glass with his other fist. Okay, seriously, you're going to hurt yourself. You need to stop, Nani said as the glass reformed and he punched it yet again, and again, and again. Each time the glass kept reforming and his fists kept getting bloodier, the mirror unbroken, but Valero kept hurting himself as long as he thought it might get him there. Ha, huh, you revealed your hand, you bitch. You only want me to stop because it will work if I do it long enough. He said as he punched it again, leaving some of his skin behind this time. Okay, seriously, stop. Do that again, and you're going on time out. Ronnie said as Valero laughed again as he punched one more time. This time, the mirror didn't break. Instead, he was pulled inside. The mirror rippled like a pond as it pulled him inside. And within seconds, the mirror stopped rippling, and he was no longer visible. Nani stood there, and she sighed and explained. He'll be released if the rest of you make it through. Does anyone else want to try to break any mirrors? Damage Pumpkin House property. Maybe try to start a fight you can't finish. No? Good. Now. She took a deep breath and composed herself as she explained. The way through the maze isn't with sight, but with cooperation. There is only one way through, and you will find it as long as you stick together. You'll know you found the way out when you see me with no face. Nani explained as she changed her pose, and all the reflections also changed pose. Each of them were different. Like they weren't reflections, but completely different people. Some were dancing, and others were pretending to look for something. With the common factor between them all, their faces were hidden for at least a few seconds, making it difficult to tell if her face was there or not. Her constant movement made it hard to gauge where she was or wasn't in the mirror maze. We have to get through the maze. Follow me, I told everyone as I asked Imp. How do I find her? I asked Imp, who appeared for a moment before she whispered. Seek neither sound nor sight. Seek that which is not there, not what is, she said before pointing into the maze entrance. So I pointed where she was pointing, and I told my friends, Keep your hands together. We need to make it through here. I said as Mary I grasped one hand, and Mary grabbed my other hand, while we began to trek into the maze. Each reflection only showed Nani, not us. The floor wasn't reflective, thank the gods. So instead of focusing on the mirrors, I focused on my steps as we walked step by step into the maze. What are you looking for? Mira, I asked, and I answered cryptically. I am not looking for anything. And when I said that, reflections began talking, every single one of them talking about a different topic entirely. And as tempting as it was to try and filter, through the many different mirrors to know what Nani was saying. I didn't let myself focus on what she was saying. It was not easy. It was like being in a room where every screen was playing something completely different at maximum volume, while also focusing on your own steps. 
Still, step by step, I walked into the maze, but the speaking only got louder and louder as I followed the twists on the floor, and despite my best efforts, bits and pieces of what Nani was saying was, made her way into my head. Just stop for a second. We can remove the brand. Just look over here. We can change your fate. If you pause just for a second, I can change your judgment. If you stop seeking me out, I will give you life without end, youth without age. All you have to do is stop, she kept saying, and I could feel my friends falter for a moment. But I kept walking, and I glanced up just for a second, and I could see Nani without her face, only a few dozen more meters away. I glanced down as I kept pushing forward, but the voices got louder and louder. You're pathetic. You're worthless, and you will die worthless. The only thing of value you have, and you reject it. You'll die as meaningless as you live, your wishes as empty as your heart. Look out, the princess of lies wants to live honestly. The voices mocked, getting louder and louder and I couldn't ignore them. And for a second, my steps faltered, and the voices grew sharper. Look at her, she's already giving up. This is even easier than I thought. Failure of a hero, failure of a villain. You really are nothing. Maybe you should have stayed home, so someone important could have used this spot. Waste of space, waste of air, waste of food, waste of sperm, waste of time. You can't even do the noble thing, can you? You can't even do the honorable thing. You could have been a princess among demons, and instead you live as the least among humanity. Why are you so dark, Lightbringer? You can't even steal a flame. What makes you think you can steal a wish? As I took another faltering step forward, the many voices quieted down. They didn't completely stop, but they weren't nearly as loud as they were. Something was clamped over my ears. I looked up and I could see Imp looking me close in the eye. I couldn't see Nani, couldn't see the mirrors, couldn't see the path, and the voices were quieted down because Imp was covering my ears with her hands. Don't listen to them, listen to me. Keep walking forward. They lie because that is the only blade they have to cut. She told me, her voice vibrating up her arms as she spoke. As I opened my mouth to speak, she interrupted me as she kept talking. If they were telling the truth, they wouldn't need to say anything. You don't address the dirt beneath your feet. You don't address the whispers beneath your notice. You don't address the anger in others' hearts. They only address you because they don't, because they want you to stop or hurt you. You're close, otherwise they wouldn't bother trying, Imp told me as I took another step forward. The voices were kept out by her hands, but an occasional word came through. Monster! Doomed! Death! Echoed through her hands, and Imp could see I was struggling. Even as I pulled my friends forward with me, they were also struggling to keep up. And unlike me, they didn't have an imp to plug their ears. And as I kept walking forward, imp did something I was not expecting. She started singing to me. A song in a language I could not recognize. But the tune was beautiful. And the words kept me from connecting any of the words from the mirrors there. It was easier to assume the words that made it through were just parts of the song I was misunderstanding. Finally, where I needed to be, Imp vanished and Nani stood in front of us. Her back to us and the door in front of her was mirrored, so I could see her face in the mirror. She glanced back my way to confirm that it was indeed the real Nani with her lack of a face. Well, you made it. You can take your idiot with you, but just know that one of you won no prize tonight. I hope you can learn to live with it. Because it was not my will that and that denied your prize. But some choices 
Some choices were made so long ago that you were a different person. Someone who never would have chosen this path if they had known. Am I right, Mary? Donna asked, and Mary stood forward. Her mouth opened like she was going to argue before she closed her mouth. If you knew what it was like to lose your family, you'd never say that, Mary said, trying to cut the faceless woman with her words. But instead, the temperature dropped in the room. You lost a mother. I lost a daughter. You left your home. My home left me, little dreamer. We are not the same. If it was up to me, you would win your prize. But I do not dare anger the Marquess of Madness. Step through the door with no wish, and be glad you were welcome to the pumpkin house, Nani said as Mary looked like she was angry enough to strike Nani, only for her eyes to close, and she took a deep inhale before she exhaled. I will see you all on the other side, she said as she stepped to the mirror door, and she opened it, leading outside of the pumpkin house, and for Valero to fall into the pumpkin house. He was shaken up, but no worse for the wear. Mary was able to see her boyfriend for only a few seconds before the door closed. Valero didn't even give her a glance as he was focused on just Nani, finally realizing the faceless woman was the witch who was giving out wishes at the center of the pumpkin house. While Valero explained what he was doing to Mirai and Nani, I tuned him out and focused on Imp. And now I noticed that she wasn't even looking my way. She was trying to get Nani's attention. She yelled. She waved her hands. She even reached out and tried to hit her mother. Anything to get her attention. But no one else could hear her. No one else could see her. And no one else could feel her. Only me. Mother! Mother, I'm here. Your daughter, yeah, is here. Yeah, yeah, is here. She yelled. Her efforts were in vain. Her name was unable to be yelled. She turned to me. Please, you have to tell her I'm here. She can give you my name. You can free me. With my name. Please, Mercy, I know how people treat you. I know what they say about you. But you're a good person. You just need my name. Please, release me. She said, her eyes in tears, cascading down her face. As I reached out to her, I will get your name. I will release you. I promise. I told her, blinking away my own tears. If I release her... I will be alone. I will have no protector. I will have no sister. I will lose one of my only friends. But I wasn't so selfish I would enslave someone just to keep a friend. But that did not mean that I was not hurt with the knowledge I was going to lose my sister. Now I focused on the conversation between Valero and Nani. Valero Antoine, named Violent Valiant. You carried your name of violence with you every step of this path. Even when violence was not the way to move forward, you boasted of your strength only to be stopped time and again. Tell me, Valero, what did you learn this fearful Feralia night? I learned that I am not strong enough. AC. So, you seek more strength? What is your wish? I wish for the strength to win every battle that I fight, Valero asked, and Nani was silent for a moment before she asked him. That is a dangerous wish, Valero. Yeah, it's dangerous for my enemies. You may want to rethink your night before you ask for your wish. I do not need to rethink my wish. 
I wish for the strength to win every battle that I fight, he said as Nani was silent for a moment before she answered. You see a path to an empty throne? I can tell you about an alchemical formula that will give you the strength. First, you need the penance of a sinner. Keep your formula in this object. Then you mix the sperm of a woman along with the tears of a devil and keep it warm next to your heart. As long as the penance of a sinner is sealed and mixed with both tears and sperm, you will have this strength. But you will need to find these objects. Wait, 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 wait. Where do I even get sperm from a woman? Valero asked. That was the easiest thing on the list for you to get, especially in this day and age. But it'll be harder for you to find a sinner's penance. Though I could, you could always make it yourself. As for the devil's tears, Nani's reflections flicked my way, but Valero did not seem to notice. Okay, I think I know where I can get that. But seriously, where can I get sperm from a woman? Valero asked while Mirai covered their face with her hand before turning to me. Is he that dense? You can't give me something that's impossible to get. That isn't fair, he said to Nani, who, despite her lack of facial features, I could tell was getting annoyed with her. He is dense, he said as Mirai reached out to grab their friend's shoulder. Look, I will get you the sperm from a woman. Please stop aggravating the ghost of a witch while within the domain of a goddess so powerful she can shape time and space. Mirai said while pulling his friend back to the door. How? What do you know that I don't? Valero asked. Mirai, who sighed for opening a, the door. A lot, apparently. Pay attention to humanities class and you won't be confused by a simple recipe, Mirai said as they opened the door and shoved him through, leaving Valero alone with his girlfriend to have an awkward conversation since he was still yelling about sperm just outside of the pumpkin house. Is he always like that? Nani asked us, breaking her character, just for a moment. No, he's unusually well-behaved tonight, said, and there was silence as Nani tried to figure out if I was joking or not. I do not envy your friend. So, Mirai Kamiya named the tactician, you have seen the limits of your power that you have come to depend on. You see the limits. You see your weakness. What is it that you learned tonight? Nani asked them as Mirai was silent before they answered. I learned that knowing the future does not give me power of the present nor the past. I learned that there are futures I cannot understand. I learned that the free will of others shapes the future just as much as my own free will. There is a lot of great power out there, greater power than I can predict or control with my own power. And how does that make you feel? Terrified, powerless, stupid. I won't let myself feel that way ever again. Oh? And what wish do you have to keep you feeling brave, powerful, and intelligent? Nani asked as Mirai made their wish. I wish for the power to change the past. I have power over the future, and I want power over the past as well, they asked, and Nani asked them. Is this a power you truly seek? Is this the path you will carve to make yourself courageous, strong, and smart? Do you even understand the power you already possess? Why do you seek to add more that you do not understand? I know my power. I know the power I seek. I know you are trying to sell me something immaterial to improve my life. But great responsibility doesn't make great men. Great power makes great men. And I will be a great man, so I deserve great power, Mirai said as Nani shook her head and she removed an hourglass 
from the folds of her dress as she held it out to Mirai. This hourglass will give you the power to go into any moment in your past. Simply state the time and turn the glass so the sand flows down. But the power to change the past comes at a price. Every moment you change in the past will be returned with an equal moment in the future lost. In essence, if you go back into the past by one minute, you will sacrifice a minute from your future, a minute that could be taken from anywhere. Maybe a minute from your deathbed, hastening your death by one minute. Maybe a minute of time you were sick, reducing your illness for that minute. Or maybe you will erase a minute from where you were in love. Maybe you will erase a minute where you are in mourning. And those are mere minutes. The further back you go into the past, the more time you will give up. Go back in time a year, and you will pay with it, pay for it with a year from an unknown future. Go back your entire lifetime, you will give up an entire lifetime of a future. Nani explained while Mirai stared at the hourglass in her hand. What a horrible price! You're asking me to give up my future to change the past? Oh, little villain, you have no idea how many great men gave up their entire lives to change the past. You have no idea how many names were erased from the history books just to make a happier past. You have no idea how many people sacrifice themselves for a future they will never see. You now have that power in your hand, and you see it as a burden instead of a gift. I won't ever give up my future, Mira said with confidence as Nani chuckled. Well, that is easy, isn't it? You have the power in your hands, but it isn't an obligation for you to use it. So you could just Never use that power, and you would live your life with an unchanged past. But a power unused is a power you don't have. Isn't that Agamemnon's little lesson? She asked, and I could see Mirai chewing on that thought mentally. Now they had a power, and had a great cost. But they weren't someone to leave power unused. They may avoid temptation now, but could they avoid it in a year? In ten years? Already, the seed of temptation was planted. They were already justifying the cost in their head. They were mentally making preparations on what circumstances were desperate enough to use the power over the past. What cost is low enough? What situation was desperate enough? wasn't enough to just say never use it. There was someone who had to judge what is worth the cost. It is the same reason my father willingly shares stories of people selling their souls to him and losing what they want. They learned that the devil had the power to give them what they wanted. They learned that their soul had value. Some people take it as a lesson to never sell their soul. But many others, too many others, instead plan how they can beat the devil deal. And I knew Mirai's look. They were contemplating the devil deal. But the tactician in them could not resist getting under Nani's skin. You know, I can use this power to go back into the past and change my wish, he said, trying to present it as a threat. A flex of power against Nani, who was the one holding all of the cards. Another lesson of Agamemnon. You have to try to at least make it clear that you aren't helpless, or if possible, make them feel threatened. But Nani clearly had experience with villains like us. You could. And who knows, maybe you have. Maybe you've already sacrificed your future many times to head back to this moment. Maybe you, you have already sacrificed a minute. Maybe you waited a night and sacrificed a night to change this night. 
maybe you waited decades before the regret gets so bad that you come back to this moment. Maybe you sacrificed your future so much that you have no future left. If that is the truth, then maybe you sacrificed your future just to gain this power again, Nani said to the silence as Mira glanced at the hourglass before putting it in their pocket. Does it work for anyone or just me? Anyone can use this power as long as they hold the hourglass, but all pay the same price. I would be careful about sharing even its existence. This power is invaluable to your chancellor, so as long as he think, thinks it's yours, you are invaluable. If anyone learns it can be stolen, well, your value is less than the hourglass, Nani said as Mirai thought about it as they glanced my way, or they decided I wasn't going to tell anyone. Why would I? In Mirai's eyes, power unused is power they don't have. In my eyes, hidden secrets keep the world turning. After Mirai stepped through the door, Nani's reflection turned my way. Mercy, love, with no chosen name, but many call you the devil's daughter. Tell me, what is your wish? Nani asked, and I could see Imp staring at me, her eyes in tears. She knew that I had a wish tonight, only to learn a few moments ago that Nani was her mother, the only person who could give me Imp's name and her freedom. I have a few questions for you first, if that's allowed. I asked her, and her reflection smiled at me as she nodded. What is your daughter's name? I asked her, and her reflection stopped smiling. And she took a step towards me, her hand out to me, like she wanted to grab me. But she stopped herself. What do you know of my daughter? She is my bottle imp, a gift from my father. I need her name to release her. She cannot... Give it to me, and you are the only person who knows. You tell me I can release her, I explained as she stood still in silence. Her reflection teared up as she finally spoke. Mercy, I cannot give her name freely. I need it to be phrased as a wish, but I only have one wish I can give you. You wish for her name... I can give you nothing else. I can give you freedom from judgment, immunity from death, youth without age, power without peer. I could give you the empty throne, but I cannot give you her name without a wish. The power names has, it takes a wish for that power. Nani explained, and I could see Imp's cold expression, asking me to pause my wish for her was one thing. Asking me to completely give it up was something else entirely. She knew the wish I was carrying this entire time, the thing that drove me through the pumpkin house, the desire that drove me through the domain of a goddess as a daughter of a devil. She knew what I needed, and even now, with her freedom mere centimeters away, she couldn't ask me to give it up for her. After all, who could ask someone else to give up their soul for them? And even though Imp knew this, Nani did not as she got closer to me, her hands on my shoulders, gentle but fearful. Mercy, I beg you, please make that wish. If I could give you the sun and moon for her freedom, I would. I could give you all of the angels of heaven for her freedom, I would. If I could give you the thrones of Olympus for her freedom, I would. But I cannot give you anything for her freedom. Nothing but my thanks. And I hope that is enough. Please, Princess of Hell, please release my daughter. Nani asked me, and I asked another question. Something heartless. You mentioned the power you could give me. Did you change my judgment so that I wouldn't be bound for hell after death? I asked the witch, 
staring at her blank face. I could not bear to face her emotions in the mirrors all around me. That is a power that I can grant, she said, tears in her voice. Could you give my friend Mary her home back? Could you bring her back to Lockhart? I asked her, and her voice sounded even sadder. I can. It is within my power to return her to Lockhart. That was why Adonsi forbade me from granting her wish. But if you wished for it, I would be forced to bring her home. But please, mercy, bring me my daughter back. I know you are among villains. I know you are raised by a prince of lies. I know that you see yourself as evil. But you have the potential to be good. Like those before you, you can choose to be good. All I have to do is be better than any of my friends. If I made any other wish, would you have the power to harm me? I asked her, and her voice was cold. No, I would not be able to harm you. Once this night ends, I move on to judgment. This is my last chance to speak with you, or her. You can be better than them. Please, give me my daughter back, Nani asked, and I took a step back, closing my eyes, and Nani sobbed quietly, and Imp remained silent. Somehow the silence was worse than the yelling mirrors. They were trying to stop me before. But now, Nani wanted me to make the right choice. And she was doing everything she could to keep me from getting angry at her. She couldn't have me make any choice that would keep her from her daughter. I kept my eyes closed as I opened my mouth for my wish. Careful to not listen to her sobs. Careful not to look at her or Imp's expression. If I saw them again one more time, I was afraid my heart would break, that I wouldn't have the strength to continue. Nani, I wish for you to tell me your daughter's name so that I can release your daughter. I said, and between her sobs, she gave me her daughter's name. My eyes still closed, I could feel the trickles of temptation in my mind. I could keep my imp for a while longer. I had the key to let her go, but I could also just keep her a while longer. She would be just as free tomorrow, or in a year, or ten years, or even a lifetime. If I released her now, then I am alone. She could be just as free and with her mother later. The joy of eternity was whether my imp was free now or free in a thousand years, she would spend just as much time with her mother, since eternity was eternal. In that moment, I could understand in the story why Barnabas and Vera were confined. Freedom was something that could always come later, but releasing them meant no more time with them anymore. I already released two monsters tonight, though and I have spent enough time with my father to know I couldn't give temptation a chance to grow. I couldn't justify it. I couldn't give myself an excuse. I couldn't give myself a reason. I had to do the right thing now, or I would convince myself that I was in the right later. I would ha have to find another way to avoid hell. Astrid Woodcarver, I release you from servitude, I said with my eyes still closed. Sobs turned happy, and I opened my eyes to see Astrid hugging her mom. Nanny, his blank face pressed against her daughter's face, and I could see feel tears in my eyes as I turned to the door. I could hear thank yous from them both as I walked out of the pumpkin house on in steady feet. It is crushing to watch your hope fail, 
even knowing it was the right thing. I know if I stayed there, I wasn't going to be able to walk out of the pumpkin house. I was alone. I was hell-bound. I was sad. But I knew I did the right thing. When I stepped outside with my friends, Mirai handed me my stuffed animal. They won for me earlier that night, and I smiled at them. A fake smile, but I had so much experience with fake smiles. I am pretty sure that my friends never saw my real one. And now, all I had to do was carry another secret pain that I could never tell anyone about.